We stalled a little bit uh, last time with uh, discussing some general aspects. We have to move much faster than we did. Uh, but uh, still, uh, some are the, the most surprising thing which we uh, learned last time was that uh, uh, in the case of the two-dimensional Ising model, uh, you don't have uh, na the naive uh, lambda of free energy or effective action, but you still do have the effective action, which would be hard to uh, to ex uh, to expect, uh, namely, um, it is the effective action for free fermions. We saw that if you have the product of order and disorder parameters, then uh, the, the fermion is free. I, I will change the notation a little bit to make them more standard. Uh, we have. Uh, I, I I want to remind you that. Uh, in two-dimensional space-time, when you have coordinates uh, x0 and x1, uh, the, you, it's convenient to introduce uh, the light cone coordinates, x plus minus. And um, will the uh, spinner field, which we discussed last time, you will easily establish uh, the connection between the notation uh, are the field psi plus. Uh, I shall uh, explain the, uh, there is another field psi minus. Uh, they are left and right moving fields and they satisfy the Dirac equation um, is, is this, it's uh, just uh, d minus uh, psi plus, d minus is d dx minus, uh, is equal to mm, m uh, psi minus, uh, and d plus psi minus is equal to, mm, to get it in this thing directly, have to put in m psi plus. Um, this, I, I suggest that as a trivial uh, home exercise, you start with the standard Dirac equation with gamma matrices and find the representation for the gamma matrices, for the Dirac matrices, which lead precisely to this. Um, now, <coughs> this is, <coughs> of course, written in the Minkowskian uh, space-time. And uh, as you see, um, under the... Lorentz transformation, x plus minus uh, transform, we, we, we need, uh, Lorentz transformation is something which leaves this invariant. And um, so uh, we actually have the symmetry, the Lorentz is e to the theta x plus x minus e to the minus theta x minus. Uh, and now you can uh, easily tell me how the psi plus, if, if I simply uh, change coordinates without touching the spin indices of, uh, of psi, of course there will be no Lorentz symmetry. Now uh, you can just see from, from what is written uh, how should you transform psi plus to and psi minus? So what we are talking about is the way what is symmetry in general. It's uh, the substitute uh, which takes one solution of the equation into another or the same solution of the equation. Uh, so uh, we are saying uh, we need something, some new and the require the, the way to find this uh, 
this factor in front is uh, just to uh, uh, just that psi tilde should be if psi is a solution, psi tilde is also a solution. Uh, so what should I do with psi? E to the theta one half. Right. Uh, it should be. Uh, it's a minus for plus or plus. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So they transform like square root of the vector. You see, if x plus is a vector, uh, uh, psi plus uh, transforms as, uh, uh, well, we, we, we see, you see the easy way to, to, to see it is we have psi plus divided by x minus, um, and uh, it should transform like psi minus. So if you change psi plus to e to the, you have actually put it the minus here, then x minus gives you uh, e to the minus theta, and psi minus transforms as e to the plus theta divided by 2. Now what uh, I used a slightly uh, different uh, Euclidean notation. How do we get uh, the uh, excuse me, just one more comment here. Uh, as you see, those fermions, the, there are two components, in two independent real components. Those real fermions are called the Majorana fermions. So we conclude that from the previous consideration that uh, the um, Ising model, two-dimensional Ising model, is described by the effective action for uh, for Majorana uh, fermions, and obviously one is left moving, another is right moving. Now, uh, what happens uh, to uh, those uh, plus minus components as we go to the Euclidean space? First of all, what happens uh, to this formula in the Euclidean space? What are those variables uh, that we always can continue, we can take imaginary time and continue things from Minkowski space time to, Euc to the Euclidean space time. For the Ising model, of course, uh, we dealt with the Euclidean space time. And it's an easy question, actually, to. Yes, of course. Uh, actually, you can always say that. Uh, we always uh, work with variables x plus minus uh, mm, say again I'll better write it like that I, I shall better use one and two uh, and i square is equal to uh, minus one in Euclidean space and plus one in Minkowski space Mm -hmm. Or you can also say that uh, we are uh, actually, I I'm a little bit digressing as usual here, but it's often a good idea to consider x plus and x minus as independent uh, complex uh, variables. So you have two dimensional complex space, which is four dimensional real space. and you impose, you choose a real hypersurface in this space, namely you for getting, uh, uh, there are different sections. And I mean that uh, for Euclidean space, x plus complex conjugate is, equal, this is holomorphic variable z, it's equal to x minus. For Minkowski space, x minus x plus complex conjugate is equal to x plus and um, minus also so x plus minus x plus minus minus plus so in one case this is a, this this is of course a, a hypersurface in the complex space and these are two different hypersurfaces and technically sometimes it's uh, convenient to consider this as independent variable <coughs> Uh, now, uh, uh, we saw that uh, 
uh, uh, that uh, this thing uh, satisfies this equation. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot, don't have time to go, uh, and I, I, I will, we will give something as an exercise to uh, discuss, or I can discuss it after the class, uh, three-dimensional generalization. The reason I'm not going to, into that is that it's not something, the problem of three-dimensionalizing model is not solved. I, I, I will uh, tell you where things stop. Uh, namely, in three-dimensionalizing model, uh, you introduce mm -hmm. uh, you introduce a disorder parameter, and you introduce it like that. Uh, first of all, you sorry. Let me start again. Uh, the first thing to establish is Kramers vanier duality. Kramers vanier in Ising three. Uh, is uh, the following thing. Uh, you have, uh, remember we compared low temperature expansion and high temperature expansion. Uh, in low temperature expansion you have spins, almost all spins are ordered, but there are drops of the minus spins. And these drops are uh, actually in three dimensions, they are surfaces. And uh, so the partition function is the sum over random surfaces, um, uh, which, uh, separate, which separate phases, and the contribution of each such thing is very simple. It's simply you, uh, what contributes is the surface tension. Mm. You have uh, volume energy is the same, of course, for minuses and for pluses. Uh, uh, and so you get e to the minus 2 beta multiplied by the area of the surface, and you have to sum over surfaces. And this is the, z th the partition function for rising 3. Um, uh, and uh, uh, you, so the, that immediately shows that we are dealing with random surfaces. And we now can find very easily the uh, statistical system for which high temperature expansion is expansion in, in terms of uh, surfaces, not contours. Uh, actually, this happens, as you probably know, and as we will discuss uh, in certain aspect of this we will be discussing. If you have the energy on, a three, on any dimensional lattice, which is gauge invariant, where you attach uh, your variables to the links, not to the sides. So you have Ising variables, but they are now sort of vector variables. Uh, you write down the energy as the sum, as a circulation of this thing. So I'm taking this sigma, this sigma, this sigma, this sigma, and uh, it is absolutely straightforward. Uh, I, it, will, it will be included in exercises to, um, to show that if you do the high temperature expansion, then uh, you generate precisely the same uh, random surfaces as, as you do from the low temperature um, stuff. So we conclude that Kramers vanier in three dimension is, do is the duality between uh, uh, usualizing and gaugeizing model. It's not self, the difference with two dimension is that uh, it is um, not a self duality. So we cannot uh, determine critical temperature, for example. Uh, not do they care very much about critical temperature, but... Uh, um, now, 
uh, and you can similarly introduce di the disorder parameter and uh, which you do in a very straightforward way you, you, you're saying we have a cube we have in a dual lattice the, the disorder parameter is located at the center of the cube we take the invisible string and when it crosses the face, the face of the lattice we change we change the sign here so uh, I will not don't plan to go into details we have too many things to discuss otherwise but it's I stress again it's a great challenge through the three-dimensionalizing model and it's I believe that uh, things can be solved because when we take when we form uh, uh, the uh, analog of fermions it is a string like and it satisfies the string generalization of this linear equation so this miracle with linearis linearization it happens here also you see it's uh, so it strongly hints that the problem is solvable because we have linear equation but no one while here going to uh, the continuous limit is uh, pretty trivial you simply uh, consider slow varying three field change uh, finite differences change by derivatives and so on so that's that was absolutely not a big deal it it is a very big deal when you work with strings and it's still the unsolved problem again in a parenthesis I would say that uh, there are recently some observation on uh, anomalous dimensions anomalous dimensions is something I'm going to discuss today <coughs> of 3D Ising model which show that there are some hidden symmetry there but uh, it's a great problem and it's it, it, it was there for the long time uh, uh, I actually started doing physics uh, uh, by uh, finding a solution of this problem uh, unfortunately it lasted not very long this solution uh, but uh, and many people try but um, you see uh, it's so much more uh, rich and uh, complicated as say the Fermat theorem but Fermat theorem took 300 years to solve uh, this thing is incomparably richer and more interesting uh, so this is just a challenge and we will I, I will be happy to tell you all I know about it uh, the, which is not much but there are some a few things um, and let's continue our um, discussion of uh, uh, general picture of the general picture in the long range in the, yeah. in the yeah well, well what is uh, you see uh, in two dimensions we can solve it uh, both on a lattice and uh, in the continuous limit but in and we can't care less it's uh, uh, about this lattice part you see it's not interesting uh, what is in, what is fascinating is the lesson it, uh, it gives us about the continuous limit uh, here my impression from spending quite some time on trying to solve it uh, is that indeed the lattice limit is not solvable uh, but uh, there are some symmetry in the continuous limit and it's just that what we already see here is that um, the effective action or the low energy action for the 2D Ising model are free fermions uh, it seems that uh, the low energy action for the Ising model would be fermion strings but who knows whether, uh, will it work or not um, okay uh, now uh, as uh, we also discussed already 
we have some reason to expect scale invariance. Namely, what is scale invariance? If we look at, the, at this equation uh, at m equals 0, m, by the way, the mass which we obtained, it, uh, we had these lattice equations which I uh, wrote down last time, which were clumsy and more or less arbitrary dependent on the type of, la of the lattice and so on. But in all cases, we have the, there is no non no source of non analyticity. So there is a point at which uh, the mass is zero, uh, but the mass is generally uh, proportional to t minus t critical. Uh, if the mass is zero at, at the critical point, the correlation functions are, let's, uh, these are the usual uh, Dirac correlation function. Again, I recommend you to spend a few minutes uh, as an exercise in establishing connection between, you take some standard textbook on quantum field theory, you find Dirac matrices, Dirac propagator, go to two dimension and choose the representation of those matrices which give you this thing. Here everything is open, lies in the open. Everything is explicit and simple, no matrices, it's just there. Mm. And uh, 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 interestingly, uh, the, 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 it, it is seen very clearly from here that spinners are square root of vectors. They transform as square root of vectors. And because of this square root, this is, double, this is the double valued representation of the rotation group and of the Lorentz group. Um, so the, this thing is 1 divided by x plus. There are also some very important I epsilons here, which we will be discussing today, but a little later. At the moment, I will not specify um, this. Uh, maybe I shall write down the correct formula, and uh, then we will discuss later. Um, again, in in the Euclidean, it is simply 1 over x plus or 1 over z. Uh, interesting thing is that uh, with correct definition, uh, d, d z bar, if you treat uh, d d z bar, th this is just the notation. Uh, you might think that this is zero, but it's not. Uh, it is actually the delta function, the two-dimensional delta function. Uh, again, check it. Uh, the the way to uh, check it is to say, uh, well, there are infinitely many ways to check it, or finitely many ways. Uh, but uh, uh, one instructive thing is to regularize this singularity by writing z bar z to the power of epsilon, differentiate and take epsilon to zero. Do it and you will see how the delta function appears. Um, although there's no z bar. In the Minkowskian space, uh, you can, uh, you just should remember that, uh, uh, well, the uh, right way where it comes from. Uh, uh, it comes uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from the following. Um, the Feynman propagator always contain for bosonic field x square minus i zero. So you have one x plus x minus minus i i epsilon and uh, fermionic propagator has a numerator which is x minus or x plus and so you get this uh, thing. One more uh, 
uh, one more reason, I'm, it's just a, uh, one more reason for this thing is that uh, the equation of motion should be psi plus proportional to the delta function. Uh, without it, it will be poorly, de uh, poorly uh, defined, but we can write it down as principal value of 1 over x plus plus i pi uh, sine of x minus delta of x plus. And you see that when you act with d minus, this thing gives you the delta function. Just useful to remember this. It's actually the best way to study uh, the Dirac theory is to start with these uh, guys uh, where everything is explicit and generalization is rather simple. Okay, um, so we found also that the energy density is psi psi and it scales, uh, this is a scale, uh, or in our new notations, psi plus psi minus, and uh, it scales like 1 over x square, uh, like uh, if, uh, like 1 over x square to the power 1 half. I shall explain this uh, in a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, Uh, there is also the way, so what, what do we mean by that? Uh, uh, let's, let me ask you a question first. Um, uh, oh, so we concluded that uh, the most, uh, suppose we accept uh, the finding that the basic variables are Majorana fermions. Um, that's the basic variable here. Oh, why the effective action should crisp? Then you would, the natural thing to ask would be, okay, I agree it might be Majorana fermions, but why do you use free Majorana fermions? Why it should be some free energy with, generally speaking, nonlinear terms? And this question has a very good answer why there are no nonlinear terms in the action, in the low energy action. The low energy action or the low energy Lagrangian is psi plus d minus psi plus plus psi minus d plus psi minus and no interaction added. Why not? Eh? Uh, what I'm asking is what, what would it be possible to add here? what kind of terms you would add if you just asked. Of course, compatible with uh, uh, Lorentz invariance, but that's... The multiplication of these two. Uh, okay, um, this term uh, would, be, would be fine if you multiply it by, by, by these two, um, but it, it has higher derivatives. It has high derivatives. The question is, can we add some interaction with minimal, with this? You see, if you multiply it, it will be, since our action is the effective action, we are supposed to keep the minimal non-trivial number of derivatives. But what you said was, of so course, correct. Are we at critical points? Or? We are at critical point, yes. So should we scale invariant? It's scale invariant, but uh, we, nevertheless, we can try to, uh, th you see, we are, checking ourselves, uh, namely, we, uh, that's the general check you should always do when working with effective actions. We first try it, the, we find the right variable, we find the effective action, and then we deform it and see whether the deformation is important at large distances or not. How can you deform this? Yeah, that's actually the point I was uh, I, I wanted to make, and the point is that these four fermion terms are zero, uh, and that's the reason why it is absent. 
if it would it not be zero, we should should have expected the four fermion terms and serious infrared corrections because of it. In two dimensions, for example, if, there, if the Ising model were described not by Majorana fermion, by, but by Dirac fermion, which is complex, then such term will be possible. You will have psi plus psi plus, for example, psi minus psi minus for Dirac fermion. But there is no such thing for Majorana. Mm. So that's um, this comment. And um, now what do I mean by writing this formula for epsilon? I mean a very concrete and simple thing. Mm. Namely, I mean that let's calculate psi plus psi minus at zero, psi plus psi minus at the point x. Uh, we can use, and this is also at the point x, we use the weak theorem um, plus and minuses for, and I'm, I'm calculating it for m equals zero. Uh, the propagator is 1 over x plus, so I get 1 over x plus x minus. Um, that, by the way, was the reason for the specific heat, for the logarithmic specific heat. Now, this means that each epsilon scales like 1 over x. Oh. Now what does uh, now we have to make these words uh, precise? Uh, that's how, by the way, the concept was gradually, slowly developed. The concept of anomalous scale invariance, scale invariance with anomalous dimensions. It's uh, just by some intuitive uh, uh, approaches, intuitive ideas, but finally it crystallized in something very precise and interesting. Uh, but originally there was some hand-waving ideas that like since uh, we have two epsilons here, this is epsilon epsilon, um, then we should ascribe, we should think that epsilon itself has this dimensionality. Um, now there is also another interesting variable, the spin. Uh, we, uh, there are various ways of calculating spin, spin correlation functions. Uh, one way, for example, is to, is to do the following. Suppose we want a correlation function of spin at zero and spin at the point R. Or we can always write it down as a product we put this the uh, sigma, suppose this is point zero, this is point one, point two, and so on. So you do sigma one, sigma one, sigma two, and so on. And each uh, each uh, quadratic expression can be its energy density, so in the continuum limit, it's, it's become psi psi. So you have the product of psi psi, which you have to calculate, and that's complicated, but, uh, but possible to do. Um, the main thing, we express this thing in terms of fermion. There is also a very simple way to do uh, the same calculation. Uh, which is slightly weird, actually. You have to double the system, uh, and uh, consider then it can be described by Dirac fermions. You have two copies of the Ising model, and the spin then becomes, uh, if you bosonize uh, those uh, fermions, the spin has simple expression. That's another possibility. But again, they are very artificial, both of them. 
uh, we will find a very general and beautiful way of doing it based on conformal field theory a little later. But at, at least I, I, I just want to tell you where it comes from. And if you calculate uh, the, the, in this way the correlation functions of two sigmas, you will find uh, this thing. And now it's, we have a lot of information and we have to uh, make, we have to, uh, it's the, the usual story is that you accumulate facts first, one by one, it's a meticulous, uh, slow uh, accumulation of facts. And then you have to make a jump because you cannot really derive anything from the facts. You can, if they help you to make the uh, right conjecture. And this right conjecture is, is the following. <clears throat> Uh, that physical, it's just the vast generalization of, of these simple calculations. First of all, uh, which is easy to accept, uh, we do accept Lorentz symmetry to be present, although we are on a lattice. Um, and as we saw last time, you have uh, discrete rotation on the lattice by pi divided by 2. Um, so yeah, the group was z4. Uh, but it's natural to expect that in the continuous that as you approach to the critical point you will get uh, relativistically invariant or rotationally invariant correlation functions. Um, that's an easy part. But, but you get more than that, you get more symmetry than that. Um, we first, we will say that uh, let's postulate now that each physical quantity in the generic system, so we consider the Ising model as well, some particular example, but uh, there are many different statistical and uh, quantum theoretical pick, uh, and string theoretical uh, systems. Um, and they are characterized by the set of local operators, which we don't know a priori. So we have the set of operators O n. Uh, and we shall assume that each operator has a certain anomalous dimension, not the naive dimension. For example, spin, the spin, uh, which is, mm, er, if we look at the uh, mean field theory, the spin, what would be the dimension of spin in the, if we don't consider the fluctuation correction, but consider the naive Landau theory. Rem I, I remind you, we got the propagator 1 over k square plus mu for uh, phi k, phi minus k in the Ising model. So what would be the naive dimension of, of, of the spin? Five, five was in the continuous limit, five was proportional to spin. It was just some uh, coefficient depending on the interaction, which is of no interest, uh, uh, but it basically was proportional to spin. So you have to determine dimension. It's dimensionless because you integrate over d to k and you get dimensionless quantities. At the same time, uh, you see that uh, physical dimension of spin is not zero, but uh, it's one eighth from this thing. So we will ascribe uh, to the different operators. We will ascribe different spi spins and what it is different anomalous dimensions. Excuse me. And in fact, 
Mm, in, that's all you can do in higher dimensions. In two dimensions, you can, in 2D, you can do slightly better than that. Uh, namely, you can have uh, an anomalous dimension for holomorphic part and an anomalous dimension for anti-holomorphic part. For the spin, uh, which is, mm, uh, uh, this, by the way, in general, it describes uh, operators uh, with uh, Lorentz uh, spin, with what, what will be uh, with non-zero Lorentz spin, uh, the sigma. Uh, it has uh, one eighth. Uh, excuse me, one sixteenth. One sixteenth. This is holomorphic. This is anti-holomorphic part. What I mean by that is that the correlation function is z18, z bar 18. Um, now, I'm so far I'm just explaining notations and gradually introducing some new concept. Uh, that's uh, not uh, of great importance at the moment that you have, but I just, uh, just to uh, uh, as a digression, uh, spin, uh, this spin operator has angular momentum zero. Uh, by the way, how we c what does that mean? Uh, when I'm saying that the operator has angular momentum or in internal spin zero, wh what do we mean by that? Uh, uh, scaling dim dimension of holomorphic and holomorphic. Yeah, uh, actually what we mean, of, yeah, we, that's right. Uh, what we mean is that uh, the correlation function for spins is invariant if you simply transform under rotation, if you replace spin by the gx. G is orthogonal matrix. So if you if your correlation functions are invariant under this transformation, the, your field has spin zero or angular momentum zero. But this is not true, for example, for fermions. You see that if you rotate, the correlation function changes. It, because here we have, uh, it, it contains the fermions, psi plus fermions are purely holomorphic. So they have one or z. And uh, therefore, they rotate as, as you, 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 you see immediately that if you perform rotation, if you change, as you go to Euclidean, you replace theta by I theta. Uh, so Z is changed like that. And you see that the correlation function of psi plus of z, you have to actually consider e to the minus i theta divided by 2 psi plus mm, at, at i theta z. This guy will have the same correlation function as this one. Uh, it might be plus here, though. Um, so, in this case, that's the definition of intrinsic angular momentum. I'm basically repeating what you know in slightly different language, and I'm basically repeating what I said uh, yesterday. Uh, okay, uh, so the difference between them are integer or half integer typically, although sometimes we have to look at more general situation. Uh, but so the deltas themselves have nothing to do with naive dimensionality of, of things. You see, the deltas are some dynamical quantities, mm, and the precise statement of scale invariance is that uh, you can replace the operator O n by lambda to the delta n. And under such replacement, under such replacement, correlation function, correlators are unchanged. Uh, 
And indeed they are, because uh, actually it's a little bit, uh, at the moment it is uh, a little bit where, where this formalization is uh, not really needed, because it, it says, it tells you something completely trivial, that if you have O n O m <coughs> of y, it just tells you that it should be x minus y uh, delta n plus delta m. Mm, so, mm, but uh, now you will see that I had some reasons to put things formally like that, that the correlation functions are unchanged under this transformation. Because we have, um, we can expect even stronger symmetry. So, before I explain this, uh, mm, let me try to explain you some reasons to expect that. Of course, the hypothesis that this is true, which appeared in the 1960s, uh, is basically came from the observations on the exact solution of the Ising model. Uh, but uh, it also has a good uh, field theoretical intuition be behind itself. Uh, namely, we saw, I already mentioned this to you, uh, we saw that um, if we write down the Schwinger-Dyson equations, uh, which have this typically the form k squared plus mu uh, minus sigma, and sigma is some function of g, because you can write that, uh, and you have the uh, if you have some theory, for example, uh, uh, then it is some bare coupling constant plus uh, things like that. You can sum of the terms. Uh, the important thing you can express, so you have lambda zero plus some functional, which depends on g and gamma. Some very complicated function, uh, but the observation is that these terms are small in comparison with interact. So this, th roughly speaking, you can say this is the um, bare Lagrangian, the uh, what you get from lambda of free energy, while this is interaction, and interaction becomes much more important. As you see from here, What's the relation between gamma and sigma? Uh, the relation is uh, that uh, sigma in Schwinger Dyson equation, you have sigma given by this formula. You can uh, write down exact expression for sigma. In fact, there is certain subtlety here. Um, in working with this equation, uh, but I will not touch it right now. Uh, important thing, important thing that uh, if you look at the example of the Ising model, and this type of, and this will be true everywhere, uh, you have a self-consistent equation. This is unimportant, this is unimportant, and uh, you have the equations uh, which don't remember about the original interaction. But the scale in the system was introduced by this original interaction. So we should expect that there is, there is scale invariance appears whenever you drop these things. And um, scale invariance means a little more than that. It also means that if you have O n1 of x1, O n nth of x n, uh, then uh, it will be proportional to, say, x1 minus x2 uh, to the power sum of sum of deltas multiplied 
by the function of what? Of course, of course ratios. Yeah, no, 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 I'm not talking conformal. I'm talking scale invariance, so it will be simply any, uh, any dimensionless uh, k minus xl, any dimensionless combinations uh, which you can have. Then, you ch you, when you substitute this, you look at these transformation laws, lambda disappears from here, lambda appears from here, uh, appears here, and it's precisely, uh, precise, it also appears on the left hand side. So, you, you uh, again, I'm slightly, it is slightly embarrassing to uh, put it in such scientific way because it's completely trivial matter. It's just the sc just scaling. Just see how. Um, now uh, it is uh, less embarrassing to put it in in such scientific way when we generalize this symmetry. Um, because we may we may think that equations of quantum field theory which would, by the way, uh, make a guess. Uh, so we indeed expect that when you drop all bare terms, uh, things will be scale invariant. And this is correct. This is indeed the case. Um, but uh, what, the anom what will be this anomalous dimension? Where they come from? Try to figure out. Im imagine that you are inventing it yourself, all these things, and then they are puzzled. Okay, I have. Do you, th do you think that uh, you you actually we may probably we will try to make this exercise if you plug in arbitrary anomalous dimension here, they will go through. Uh, the system doesn't know anything uh, about deltas, and any delta would do. Any delta would do. It's a, and it's clear from the argument I gave you, because we uh, removed all sources of uh, dimensionality, so to say. So, what do you think will determine them eventually? What could determine some analogy? It's not precise thinking, but you have to uh, try to get some intuitive argument where they may come from. Like this one, one x, like the exact dimensionality is a spin, right? Where do you? Uh, yeah, yeah. Or more general. More no, no. I mean more general. You have. Uh, for example, this one quarter here, what's the origin of it? Why it is one quarter while the equation of quantum field theory allow us to have any deltas? No, the point is that uh, you can indeed proceed calculating anomalous dimensions using these equations in some, by, by some approximate method. And uh, they are determined, uh, what you get is a kind of an eigenvalue problem. You see, uh, you have, what happens uh, is that you plug in some deltas, correlation function with some deltas, you get out, uh, uh, again, a scale invariant function with the same deltas, but with some coefficient. And if you know the equation, if you need, want the equation to be satisfied, you get a certain eigenvalue condition uh, which determines delta. This is just very vague and intentionally vague because we, in a modern way, we will be determining uh, these deltas uh, from the Verasora algebra and things like that. But it's important to understand their uh, vulgar origin, so to say. Uh, they just needed, you need to adjust this delta to satisfy not only the scaling in this equation, but the absolute value, so normalization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so when you said that any, any delta would work through, like, yeah, scaling-wise? Yeah, okay. scaling-wise it will go through, okay. yes, yes. Um, exactly. 
Um, okay, now one more generalization. So yeah, go ahead. Uh, and the equations which people, like some complex uh, chains of equations for conformal field theories, uh, where we, they would uh, write down some chains of equation and then... Uh, well, okay, I'll ask it after the lecture. Okay. Um, now... Uh, uh, now let's uh, talk about conformal invariance and let's formulate the postulates which uh, will determine possible conformal field theories. Uh, conformal, it's, uh, from the argument I gave, it's natural to expect that you can have, uh, you can change the scale not globally, it's after all local field theory, so it is natural to try at least whether um, uh, you can have more uh, not the uh, not the scale transformation, uh, but uh, something which should be defined carefully, and we will define it carefully. Something like uh, x to lambda of x, uh, x. It's not precise definition yet, I'm, I'm going to give one. But uh, intuitively we want, uh, we want to try to, to let the scale change at different points uh, as you change uh, uh, the... Uh, the precise, the, the, this uh, uh, transformation is well known to mathematicians. And it is simply the following. Uh, suppose we have a, uh, some general covariant transformation, like in general relativity. Um, then the metric, we define the new metric tensor. If original metric tensor was delta mu nu, the metric tensor uh, after transformation will be df lambda dx mu, df lambda dx mu. Um, now let's, cons the conformal group is, consists of the subgroup of this, uh, of this, uh, which is called diffeomorphisms, uh, for which, so, uh, we restrict well, let me uh, ask you the simple question first. Uh, all right, why I cannot, this is the group of diffeomorphism. What will happen uh, if I look at the, if I postulate, try to postulate that uh, I'm looking for the theory invariant under all diffeomorphisms. So we have the correlation functions. And we, in a sense, we can try to postulate that question mark means that we will fail miserably. Uh, um, symmetry is a sim probably multiplied by something. Uh, why this is uh, non-starter? Uh, generally, yes, but uh, uh, say something more concrete. In principle, you that's right, but uh, uh, there is some very concrete objection which you can make by just losing. What kind of function they will be? That's uh, what I'm asking. Independent of x. Yeah, they actually, at best, uh, they could be some delta functions because uh, when you have, if f is more or less arbitrary, it means they are x independent. And that's, by the way, uh, the reason why in quantum gravity uh, correlation functions by themselves uh, don't have any meaning. 
Mm. In quantum gravity, you do have uh, this symmetry, but you don't have correlation functions. You have only you have a different you have different quantities, different observables. Correlation functions are observables only without gravity. Um, <clears throat> okay, but we can, so this fails. Mm. However, uh, we can try uh, a more restricted symmetry. Uh, which uh, actually transformed Jimmy Nu, uh, for which Jimmy Nu is equal to some function rho of x multiplied by delta mu. Nu. And that obviously means that you don't change the, this, in this transformation, you have some Riemannian geometry, you don't change. Um, angles between lines, for example, uh, but you change this locally the scale. Um, well, let's uh, take a look at this condition, at this equation, and we will find... Can you specify more about uh, this uh, general constraint if we assume that the relational functions are invariant under so yeah. Okay. What what I wanted to say is that uh, let's suppose you, you have to look at some. Suppose you have a two point function, mm, which uh, is uh, the correlation functions of sum up of two operators. Um, if we have diffeomorphism symmetry in the theory, then this this is some we assume this is some concrete function, oh, which we uh, can write, and these functions should satisfy if we, if we have scalar operator, we have simply the transformation like that, and in this case we need for to find the function for which we have this equality. If you have, uh, now, uh, with arbitrary function f, now they may be multiplied by some factor. The only thing which is possible to find, if, if you have any a normal function, this will not be the case, of course. Uh, the only key possibility is that if you have a delta function or some derivatives of the delta function, then you can, uh, then you definitely can uh, have this symmetry. But then you don't have any any uh, meat, uh, so to say, in the theory. It's just bare bones, mm, mm, nothing to eat. Uh, so that's what that's what I what I meant. It will not be the case. The remarkable thing is that uh, this restricted transformation will lead to a, a, to, to a rich, uh, quite rich theory. Um, but it's a very actually, you know, this is a very important and interesting question, what are observables and not completely clear, clarified, what are full set of observables in quantum gravity? Uh, that shows, since I'm digressing, I will be digressing, uh, it shows that if you try to calculate these guys, uh, the answer, uh, you can get some answer. For example, you can ask me the following question. You should have asked question. Uh, okay, you are saying that this green function doesn't exist or is completely trivial. But on the other hand, we can take a particle, scalar particle, take a, say, a graviton, and we have, we have uh, the expre Feynman diagram expression of the correlation, for the correlation function. So I'm talking about scalar fields coupled to gravity. And the question is, and we, we calculate them, calculate car quantum corrections. In each order, uh, quantum corrections come out 
well, there, there are divergences, but that's a different matter. Uh, so, how would you um, make, how would you relate uh, the fact that uh, correction, quantum corrections, so this is a graviton, you have propagator, you have vertices, you have integrals, everything is well defined. You have Einstein theory coupled to scalar field like, say, in the theory of simplest models of inflation. You have scalar field coupled to gravity. Um, and naively, if you calculate Green function, everything will be fine. So how, tr try to resolve this with this. Uh, where is, uh, what is the ambiguity in quantum electrodynamics? Remember, um, the photon, you can calculate photon in different gauges. Can we have photon propagator? So, uh, uh, what, what do you say in quantum electrodynamics about uh, these gauge invariants, about the fact that you have photon propagator and it has transverse part and longitudinal part uh, and in principle, you can choose different gauges, get different results. So what is the, in, in QED, what, what, what is the answer to this ambiguity? Physical results in uh, what, what, what do you call physical results, more precisely? Gauge invariant. Uh, gauge If you calculate neutral operators, you have electron propagator is neutral. You have electron, I'm talking of QED now. And it is charged field, and its correlator is gauge dependent. Okay. However, if you take say something like that, some density, uh, density of charge, this density psi bar psi, psi star psi, this density is uh, gauge invariant. It's neutral. Uh, and if you calculate the correlation function of two currents or two densities, uh, there will be no gauge dependence in quantum electrodynamics. Okay? Um, and th what is remarkable in quantum electrodynamics, in the young mill theory, in QCD, you can always find a complete set of, uh, as you said, physical operators. Namely, the operators invariant under, ga under the gauge group. Okay. Now go back. We go back to uh, gravity. Uh, what uh, uh, what can you say about neutral? Is there anything neutral in gravity? Here, the density operator was neutral. Okay. Here we should consider some. The invariance here is just different or different Yes. Okay. So. So, any try any example. Suppose, uh, yeah. Well, not necessarily. We can consider masses fields, for example. Uh, but uh, suppose we we'll let ourselves do whatever, whatever we can. If we, it's it's okay to remove the mass if the mass is a problem, but there is uh, the thing is, you see. We have uh, scalar fields, but this and one might think that scalar means uh, that they are neutral, but they are not because they change. They they transform like so. They do change. Therefore, if you have any combination of scalar fields, any, uh, it will be gauge dependent. When you do this calculation, you indeed get some finite result. But uh, uh, this finite result is actually, uh, uh, it does you no good uh, because it's, gauge, it's fully gauge dependent. Um, so th what is uh, physical in, uh, in, in gravity is much more subtle things. Uh, either some S for some spaces, for asymptotically flat spaces, it is S matrices, 
and there are also some integrated invariants which are uh, well this is a long story and I'm not I will not go into it now but you see the pro uh, what I hope I convey to you is there is a serious problem with this uh, the serious difference with uh, with the cases which we know um, <coughs> namely the absence of invariant operators. When we, I, will, I will return to these issues uh, when we will be discussing ADS-CFT. <coughs> okay, uh, now returning back to our stuff. Uh, we are doing? Uh, uh, back to our stuff, uh, we actually have to solve to, to see what kind of transformation is, is this and uh, for that it's convenient to write down as infinitesimal transformation uh, so uh, up to the second order we get a variation of g mu nu we get when we plug it in we get uh, d mu epsilon nu plus d nu epsilon nu uh, minus uh, rho of x it should be equal to rho of x delta mu nu. So we have to solve uh, this equation to, to find allowed rho and allowed uh, epsilon. Um, uh, first of all uh, let's do it in two dimensions and then we will go to higher dimensions. In two dimensions, um, uh, in two dimensions we have two equations, uh, d1 epsilon 2 plus d2 epsilon 1 is equal to 0. I actually can always express rho in terms, if I take the trace of this equation, I of course express rho in terms of epsilon, so we have to determine these epsilons. This is one two component and if we take one one component uh, we will get the equation uh, uh, well the equation will be t1 epsilon 1 twice is equal to rho twice d2 epsilon 2 is also equal to rho uh, I, so after I subtract these two equations, uh, I will get two. I will get final constraint. Okay, now what is this? What kind of equation is this? You actually know it in like different... Uh, like, like what? Cash, yeah, it's cauchy riemann equation, and we will write it very simply. It's in complex. If you use the complex notations, uh, things uh, simplify, and we will find the general solution of this equation. Um, namely, uh, let's do it this way. Uh, let's multiply this by i, and add together. Then you will have d1 epsilon 1 plus i epsilon 2 uh, minus uh, d2 epsilon 2 uh, epsilon 2 minus i epsilon 1 uh, which is equal to d1 plus i d2 epsilon 1 plus i epsilon 2. Uh, so the solution of this uh, in, in, in the variable uh, this is d dz bar Um, uh, it's, it's good to remember uh, trivial thing of course but uh, useful 
that uh, when you have a plus here, since z bar in the denominator, it, it is not z, it is z bar, because it is, it, it, it stands, it, it is placed in the denominator, and you divide by z bar, which from the point of rotation group uh, means the same as z. Uh, so it's uh, this Kashirima. simply tells you that uh, d d z bar of epsilon is zero, so epsilon is just an arbitrary analytic function. We have the infinite conformal group, uh, which uh, uh, actually um, is the reason why uh, in two-dimensional two -dimensional, uh, things are in good shape. Now let's go to, to higher dimensions. So in, we determined uh, this thing. Uh, rho, of course, is the coefficient of uh, deformation is very easy to determine. It's simply d z epsilon, absolute value square. Uh, so that's uh, in 2D, everything is very simple. Um, in higher dimensions, we have to solve the equation d mu epsilon nu plus d nu epsilon nu uh, minus, uh, I, I, I will take the trace here, so we have, uh, if we take the trace, we have 2 d lambda epsilon lambda is equal to d dimension multiplied by rho. Um, so, uh, it must be equal to uh, 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 2 divided by d, uh, d lambda epsilon lambda multiplied by delta minimum. Uh, now, the main uh, difference between d equals 2 and d not equals 2, the main constraint, the, is that these relations, probably I should have started with it, let's write it down in this way. Uh, the left-hand side uh, has uh, zero trace uh, if uh, uh, if d is equal to. However, uh, well, actually it has zero trace. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that uh, if d is, that's a statement which will, then uh, you can write the most general solution of this equation by simply expanding it in, in x, you have constant translations. Then you have uh, beta mu nu uh, anti-symmetric tensor multiplied by x nu, plus you have lambda x nu, and you have some symmetric tensor x nu x nu. If you uh, well, we'll continue, finish uh, uh, next time, I guess. Uh, yeah, um, the, but I, I, I shall just, I will finish the cal this simple calculation next time. But the point is that you can always start expanding, and you will see that uh, uh, that's where it ends. All terms of the third order in higher dimensions are incompatible with this equation. So we have finite dimensional, we have actually um, a 15 parameter group uh, in four dimensions, for example, uh, the structure of which we will determine. Uh, but uh, in uh, two dimensions, it's, a, it's an infinite group. That's the reason, actually. Uh, why conformal field theory is so powerful in 2D. Uh, in 2D, it's basically 
quantum version of complex analysis is as powerful as uh, as the method of conformal maps in cl in complex analysis. It's a quantum version. It's complex analysis uh, made in in the Hilbert space. That we will see next time. In Heidi, it's more limited. Okay, let's stop here. <clears throat>